Hello everyone. Today we will be understanding one topic, which is matter. A very easy and interesting topic about matter. So matter, it it is anything that occupies space and has mass. So all these objects, which of course occupy certain space and has mass, is called matter. So of course chair, bed, river, mountain, these are all the matter. So it can be either living matter. or the number 2 it can be non living matter so in the living matter there can be of course they can all grow move reproduce for example plants and animals where in the non living matter of course uh, stones paper river mountain chair all these are the non living matter okay so let's understand that uh, where this matter has been arrived and of course the postulate of the john dalton okay so yes of course uh, the number one postulate with which john dalton has actually explained to us is the first one is that all matter it is made up of tiny and they all are indivisible particles called atoms so yes from here we have been given certain term which is called atom so these are the indivisible basically uh, particles which are called atoms okay the number 2 postulate given by john dalton it is that uh, all atoms of a specific element they are identical in mass size and other properties as well okay where uh, the atoms of different elements they exhibit different properties but where they are vary in mass and size also the third one that atoms can neither be destroyed nor be created so you all can write as well that the atoms they can neither be created nor be destroyed also that atoms of different elements they can combine with each other in a fixed whole number ratios to produce or to form compounds so yes they can together combine and make compounds but there are certain limitations as well in dalton's atomic theory as well that it does not account for isobars where the theory also does not account for the allotropes and also does not account for the isotopes as well so you must have uh, understood about two definitions we have just now, uh, right now understood which is atoms and compounds yes they do have difference in between uh, where the atoms let me just explain so atoms it is the smallest possible unit of the matter okay the one which we are understanding it is the smallest possible unit of the matter in which they are exhibiting the all properties of a matter where the compound we can say that it has the capacity or capable of having its own independent existence so yes the compounds they can exist on their own where the atoms yes they exhibit all the properties of the matter which is the very very smallest unit of the matter okay so this was about the matter and how it is being made what is the smallest uh, quantity or smallest unit which we have just understood okay now most important we going to understand is the characteristics of particles of matter so let's let now understand that what are the features which all these matter or all these particles are showcasing so that different properties has been arised okay so characteristics of particles of matter let's understand now so there are basic three characteristics we going to understand first characteristic that particles of the matter they have the spaces in between them yes these particles so let me just explain that uh, suppose it's a book okay and you must have seen that book has proper fixed shape as well right because there's very very less space in between them okay so yes they do have space the particles of matter they do have space but it depends on which example we are talking about so particular this particular matter it has it is having lesser space but it, yes it do have this space the second one don't worry we going to understand it with lots of other examples as well the second characteristics of a particle of a matter that they are continuously moving 
okay so they are continuously moving yes this is quite amazed that these particles are actually move, uh, moving and yes more examples i will be uh, giving you afterwards and the third one that the particles of matter they can attract each other also all right so let's understand that how these characteristics of matter uh, matter is being helpful for our daily life let's apply apply these particles or these matter in different different situations okay so for example let's understand when if i have taken a beaker which is filled with water okay and if i add potassium permanganate if i have taken okay and yes it has a purple color but when i have add two three drops of potassium permanganate into a glass of water you can see that the purple color slowly and steadily comes in the motion with these particles of water as well means that water is trying to dissolve this particular potassium permanganate into them okay so afterwards we can see that the whole color of the beaker becomes purple how does this happen it is happened because these particles of potassium permanganate they were continuously moving and that's why they have taken in the spaces which were there in between the particles of the water so yes the particles of a matter it has space where the particles of the potassium permanganate they are continuously moving that's why they have completely dissolved into it okay this is the major major uh, application which we have understood here i can give you more examples as well uh, so i hope you have uh, of course taken the fragrance of an incense stick which is agarbatti we can say okay incense stick it also gives good fragrance right how it is giving us because it is being there because there are two gases which are being mixed let's understand how so if we have burned this agarbatti okay in one room and uh, in the second room in the next adjacent room we can find out that the fragrance has actually reached okay how it is because this particular fragrance which are also having particles they are mixed in the particles of the other air as well right and that's why it spreads in the whole room very very quickly and these particles of the gases they produced by burning of the incense stick which moves very rapidly in all the directions okay so now it is being moving in all the directions so then it will be mixing with the moving particles and in the air which are present already so this shows that particles are also moving so this is how we can get to know that uh, whenever a delicious food is being cooked in a kitchen as well then we can also get to know of yes there is a fragrance being going on and a very delicious food is being cooked here in the kitchen so that's why because the particles of matter they are continuously moving i hope you all have understood this right so this was about a solid or a gas how they are being dissolving or how they are spreading and continuously moving as well right so other examples we can also give that uh, of course when sugar is dissolved in the water as well right how they are so dissolving because particles of matter of uh, or we can say water they have certain spaces if they have certain spaces then definitely sugar particles can come and take that space of the particles in between the particles of the water so this is how we can get to know that yes the particles uh, of matter it has spaces okay so this was about the major characteristics of particles of matter so let's understand one more uh, motion of the particles which is the brownian motion of the particles so you all can write down this as well so brownian motion of particles let's understand so basically whenever any particular movement of particles is going on which is in random direction or any zigzag movement is going on so this indicates that the particles in a fluid as a result the continuous bombardment from molecules of the surrounding medium is known as this brownian motion for example i can give you more examples as well just like dust okay so dust it moves randomly because the random moving particles which we have just understood they colloid 
with the dust particles and then they can form the random movement so this random or zigzag movement is known as brownian motion of the particles so this we have understood here the characteristics they are being used in so many places and uh, of course day to day life as well this is how we can get to know that what are the basic characteristics of matter let's quickly revise this so they uh, of course particles of matter they have spaces in between them they are continuously moving and also particles of matter they can attract each other as well okay so this was the basic uh, of course movement which is going on uh, in between the particles of the matter so now let's understand very very important next topic which is the classification of the matter so there are basic classification of the matter so let's understand this so these are there are three states of matter what are they let's understand so number one state we're going to learn is solid the second state we're going to learn is the liquid and the third state we're going to learn is the gaseous state so there are so many differences in between solid liquid and gases because of their particles movement energy distance between the particles as well so let's first talk about solid and understand all its properties so basically solid i can give you more examples like of course a glass a ball a pen a book and many other examples so these are the solid basically and why they are solid because they are very very closely packed so this is the major property of a solid that the all the particles they are very very closely packed yes the particles have spaces but if we compare with the liquid and gases they are very closely packed okay because of this let's understand they have very high force of attraction very very high force of attraction in between the particles of the matter so which is very strong as they are closely packed as they are closely packed they have strong force of attraction due to that these particles have minimum kinetic energy they have minimum kinetic energy why they are having minimum kinetic energy because they are not having enough space to move from one place to another that's why they are having minimum kinetic energy so we have to understand it by a basic logic that of course when we take an example of a book right so the particles of the book they are not moving here and there that because they are closely packed and they are having high force of attraction okay and this is how because they are having minimum kinetic energy this is why the solids they have definite shape and volume so of course we can uh, press this particular we can try to change the shape of a book we can try to change the shape of a ball right but no because they are having Uh, the particles are very very closely packed very closely tightly packed and yes that is why they are having definite shape and the volume as well as and yes they do have high density which cannot be diffused they do have high density and yes due to that they are are incompressible so i was just giving you an example like ball we can try to push a ball we can try to uh, mold the shape but we cannot the shape remains the same because the particles they are very very closely packed and uh, of course they are having strong force of attraction between the particles of the matter that is why they are having high density and incompressible so this is how you can understand that how one because of one property all the other properties are interdependent and this is how we can create a state of matter so if you remember one property then uh, you can definitely connect th this particular property with the other properties as well okay so this was about solids now let's understand about the liquids so here i will be writing down about the liquids 
All right. So when we talk about liquid and when we hear the word liquid, always water, juice, this do comes in our mind, right? And you can take water in a glass. We can take a sip, uh, the water from the water, uh, from the glass basically. And also the same water, if it is very lesser amount, we can of course uh, mix it or we can take it in another container as well we can have a full bucket of water as well so i hope you must have understood this that the same water is being kept in different different shapes in different different containers but we can see that particular water is taking the shape of that container what we have understood that yes these liquid particles they are not having definite shape so let's understand why they are not having definite shapes because the liquid, the particles, they are less closely packed. So yes, they do have spaces in between, more spaces as compared to the solid particles in between the particles of the liquids. And due to that, yes, the force of attraction between the particles is less strong as well. Force of attraction between the particles, they are less strong as compared to the particles of the solid. And yes, of course, if they are having more spaces, then they can move from one place to another definitely, right? So this is how their kinetic energy is more than that in the solid. So kinetic energy in between the particles of the liquid is more as compared to the solids. Right? So, we have just understood the first property and you can just imagine that how we are connecting this particular property with other properties as well. Right? And as they are less closely packed and yes, they can, uh, take, uh, they can take the shape of any particular container which we are adding. So, definitely they do not have definite shape. They do not, the particles of the liquid, they do not have definite shape shape but if we have understood that if I have taken 100 ml of water in a beaker, if I have taken 100 ml of water in a jug, if I have taken 100 ml of water in a bucket. So that 100 ml means the volume remains the same only the shape is being changed. So we can write down that they do not have definite shape but they do have definite volume. Okay. And of course, density is lower than the solids, right? So, density is lower than solids. And this is how they can diffuse, which we were discussing in the previously the examples when potassium permanganate were able to dissolve or diffuse in the beaker, which is having liquid or which is having water, right? And yes, they are almost incompressible. We can try. Yes, they do have spaces in between the particles of the matter. But yes, they are almost incompressible. Almost. Where the uh, particles of the solids, they are totally incompressible. So, this, these are the properties of liquids which we have just understood and I have meanwhile given the following examples also. This is how you can also understand that yes, the liquids, the particles of liquids, they are less closely packed means they do have spaces in between the particles of the liquid. This is how the force of attraction is lesser strong as well as they do not directly come in contact where the kinetic energy is more means they are having enough space to move from one place to another. This is why they do not have a definite shape but they do have definite volume. So I hope you all have understood about the liquids. Now let's quickly move to the third state of matter which is the gases. Yes, we of course breathe oxygen gas, gases are there around us in our atmosphere. So, I, we can understand that yes, these particles of the gases, they are very, very far apart from each other means they are, have lots of spaces in between them. So, you all can write that yes, the particles of gases, they are far apart from each other. And if they are very, very far apart from each other, means their attraction, force of attraction is ne almost negligible. Force of attraction 
is almost negligible. So, as they are having very very lesser almost no force of attraction, this is why they get enough space to move from one place to another. That means the particles of gases, they have the maximum kinetic energy. Either the particles of the solids, they are having minimum kinetic energy, where uh, the particles of the gases, they are having the maximum kinetic energy and yes we can simply understand whenever we put gas in a cylinder or any other place then they of course they do not have definite shape they can just put into the container but and also they do not have definite volume so neither definite shape nor definite volume so by this we are even differentiating also in between solid particles of solid liquid and gaseous as well right that how the solids they have definite shape and definite volume where the liquid they have definite shape and uh, not uh, of course they do not have the definite shape but definite volume but the gaseous particles they are neither having definite shape nor definite volume and this is why they are having quite spaces and they are highly compressible so this is the one more difference we have just understood in between the particles of solid, liquid and gases that they are highly compressible. So this was about the solids, liquid and gases, the properties which we have just understood. So let's quickly revise. Solids we have understood that they are having very very lesser space, they are totally closed with each other where the uh, sol uh, liquid particles they have do have lesser of course spaces but they have more spaces as compared to the solid where the gases they are totally far from each other the particles of the gases now let's talk about the solids they are having uh, of course very lesser uh, they are having very very uh, strong force of attraction in the solid cases as they are having the particles are very tightly packed in uh, case of liquid they are not very strong but in the case of gases they are almost negligible and in the case of solids, talking about kinetic energy, as they do not have enough space to move from one place to another, that is why in the case of solids, they are having minimum kinetic energy. And yes, uh, the kinetic energy in liquids is more than solids, but lesser than gases, as the gaseous particles having far apart from each other, that's why they are having the maximum kinetic energy. And the very, very important that solids, they have definite shape and volume, where the liquid, they of course do not have definite shape, but have the definite volume where the gaseous particles they neither have definite shape nor definite volume so this was about matter which occupies space and has mass and what are the states of matter which we have discussed solids liquids and gaseous i hope you all have understood thank you so much everyone hello everyone let's discuss a very important topic where we will be discussing that how we can change a particular state of matter in the previous session we have discussed about solid liquid and gases so these are the classification of matter but in today's session we will be learning that if we have to change a particular state from one state into another state okay so these changes can be done or with they can interconvert into each other by two methods first one if we change the temperature of that substance by change or by changing the temperature and second we will be understanding if we change a pressure which is being applied on that matter so by changing the pressure of matter so let's discuss first about temperature and we will be getting to know that how we can convert or from one state of matter into the another state of matter so let's discuss first about temperature so the common unit that we usually uh, use to measure the temperature is degree celsius and the si unit of temperature is kelvin so we can denote it by capital K. 
okay and we can also understand one relationship between uh, kelvin and uh, of course the si unit and the common unit so 0 degrees celsius is equals to 273 kelvin so we can of course do one question as well so if we have 100 degrees celsius okay so we will just add 100 degree celsius plus 273 kelvin which we will be forming as 373 kelvin so 100 degree celsius will be equal to 373 kelvin okay so this was about just a temperature that what is the si unit of the temperature so now we will be using this particular uh, temperature and we can change the temperature of a matter and then we will be changing into another in uh, matter all right so first as we know that solid liquid and gas these three states of matter so first let's understand solid to liquid if a substance is in solid and we have to convert into liquid state of matter so how we can convert by changing the temperature so yes we have to increase the temperature we have to increase the temperature of the solid so that the kinetic energy of the particles will be increasing so they will be increasing which can overcome the forces of attraction so as we know that suppose this is a, a matter solid matter and uh, the particles are very closely packed so we have to apply the heat or we can increase the temperature so that these particles will overcome the forces of attraction which they were actually having and they will be generating certain space in between the particles of the matter and this is how they can convert into liquid state of matter where they will be having certain spaces in between them so the conversion of solid into liquid this process is known as melting so the change of solid state of a substance into liquid this is called as melting and the temperature at which the solid melts totally melts to become a liquid at the atmospheric pressure is it will be calling as melting point of that particular substance so let's for an example the melting point of ice ice is a solid it is equals to 0 degree celsius okay so in this particularly we have just understood about melting that ice melts okay at 0 degree celsius if we increase the temperature then definitely it will be converting into the liquid one why because we have to increase the kinetic energy by applying the temperature so that they can overcome the forces of attraction this was about solid to liquid which is the one case now we will be converting from liquid to gaseous state okay this is the one rule the second one will be from liquid to gas so now it has become water okay and now if we apply more heat means we are giving more uh, increasing the temperature of the substance if we are again increasing the temperature then again the kinetic energy will be improving and increasing right so the kinetic energy of the particles is increasing and then they can become into gas so the particles will be moving more away or far away from each other then they will becoming into gas so the now the liquid has turned into gas and this particular method or this phenomenon is known as boiling so the second process we will be understanding when we are converting the liquid state into the gaseous state and when the liquid is heated it is becoming at a boiling point of that matter so the temperature at which liquid starts boiling and converting into vapor state on heating and even uh, at a given pressure also so this is called boiling point and yes as the water uh, the after melting the solid or the ice has become into liquid or the water now if we again give heat to the water so that it can become vapor state so now the boiling point of water becomes 100 degrees celsius 
So this can be asked in the paper about solid to liquid, liquid to gas. What is the melting point of ice? What is the boiling point of water? So it is 100 degree Celsius. Okay. So this was about from solid to liquid and liquid to gaseous. Now let's understand the third interconversion which we are forming from gas or uh, of course to become into the liquid state. Okay, so if it is becoming into liquid state, then there is also one more process. We will be discussing that only. Okay, so now we will be discussing from gaseous state, which is becoming into the liquid state. All right, so when gaseous or we can say first in the previous concepts, we are applying heat, we are increasing the temperature. Now, if we are coming back, okay, from gas to liquid, we are coming back to a particular state. So, there we have to cool down, okay, means we have to decrease the temperature. So, on cooling a gas or we can say a steam or we can say water vapor, which they have been already formed. So, water vapor, it will be becoming if we will be cooling down so that the kinetic energy if we are cooling it so that kinetic energy will be dropping down so that they can come back to their original state or they can come near to the particles of the matter. So basic difference that we have understood in the gaseous state the particles are very far away from each other where if we will be cooling them okay so then the particles will be coming close to each other means we are dropping the kinetic energy so that they can come near with each other and they can form a liquid state okay. So this process in which water vapor is converting into water, this process is known as condensation. A gas on cooling turns into liquid state at a specific temperature is called condensation or liquefaction as well. Okay, so now again we have come across with solid, liquid and gas. Earlier we have understood these two states. Now we have coming into from gaseous to liquid we have understood which is condensation. Uh, condensation. Now we will be understanding that when we are converting this water back into ice. Okay, so let's understand the fourth concept which is liquid to solid. Okay, and that might be very much easier uh, when there is a summer time, of course, we require lots of ice. So what we do, we try to freeze in the refrigerator. So from freeze, we can get freezing, the process known as freezing. So it is a process in which when liquid is getting again cooled down. So we have to again try that temperature should be more lower down. Now we have to make sure that these spaces should also become very much lesser so that it can become again solid, right? So again we have to cool it down, lowering the temperature so that the particles will be losing again their kinetic energy and they will be coming into their rest position or stationary position. So now we have to again make sure that kinetic energy should be reduced and they have to cool down. The particles has to be, the temperature has to be cooled down so that the liquid can become into solid state. So this particular phenomenon is known as freezing. The change of a liquid substance into the solid one where the temperature gets lower down is called as freezing. So from freezing we have the freezing point which is the temperature at which the state of a substance changes from a liquid to a solid at a given pressure is known as freezing point of that substance. So I hope it is cleared right. So as you know that we have understood uh, four processes here but there are certain energy which are being also involved let's discuss here due to which they are the states of matter gets changed from one state to the another state so let's understand the what is that heat called which is there to help a state of matter so that they can absorb the heat or release the heat uh, so that they can become into another state of matter, right? So let's discuss about this as well. So latent heat, latent means hidden, 
the hidden heat is there which is already there in the beaker so that it can help uh, a particular state of matter so that it can change it okay so latent heat it is uh, a heat or energy which is being either absorbed or it has released during any particular phase or when there is a change of a substance from solid to liquid liquid to gas or any other state of matter so and of course from gas to liquid and liquid to solid as well so it's a basically a heating agent or a property right so similarly we have from this latent heat we have two latent heat type let's understand so one is the latent heat of fusion fusion so what does this particular word means we are only concentrating on the term so that we will never forget that so fusion when we are fusing things when we are making it basically into the uh, liquid state so yes the heat energy required to convert basically 1 kg of solid into liquid state at atmospheric pressure or we can say at its melting point this is known as latent heat of fusion so the solid is converting into the liquid state the energy which is being uh, required to convert 1 uh, kg of a solid into liquid okay so this is about latent heat of fusion now of course the next stage is the latent heat of vaporization so as the word indicates we will be converting liquid into the gas state right so vaporization we are forming vapors right so of course the heat energy required to convert 1 kg of liquid into the gaseous state at the atmospheric pressure or we can say at its boiling point this is called as latent heat of vaporization i hope it is clear right all right so this was about solid to liquid and liquid to gas i hope uh, you must have boiled uh, water you know on a beaker uh, in the gas stove as well right but when we even touch a particular liquid which is very hot uh, then of course it gets burned and we feel lot of pain but when accidentally a uh, water vapor which is there which are being just evaporated and uh, if we touch that if we come in contact with that particular water vapor it really burns a lot which basically indicates that water vapor at, at 373 kelvin yes it was 100 degree celsius so we have already discussed this how we can convert it so 373 kelvin uh, if the water temp uh, vapor it is so it is having more energy as it is having more energy at than the water at the same temperature so water it is also boiling right at 100 degree celsius and water vapor which is of course become a water vapor and it is a gaseous state but it is of course having the same temperature but still we burn we get burned lot by the water vapor why because water has basically absorbed certain amount of energy to become into water vapor Th that means that water vapor is having good amount of energy as compared to the water that energy is called as in the form of latent heat of vaporization which has been hidden that we have already understood so that is in the form of latent heat of vaporization which can cause great burns to us so this is how very very important concept that water and water vapor at the same temperature still water vapor burns a lot because of the presence of latent heat of vaporization which is the energy being absorbed this is how the uh, extra burn or more burn will be there on our palm so this was about latent heat and who will be giving of course lot of heat and burns right so we have just quickly discussed about solid liquid state conversion four properties we have just discussed but if i say that if i have to directly convert solid into the gaseous state means the point number 5 it will be arising so that will be called as sublimation i hope you must have seen naphthalene balls at home and uh, any particular solid which gets directly converted into gaseous state so this process is known as sublimation without converting into liquid state this is called as sublimation so that is from solid 
to liquid but certain uh, solid to gaseous state but certain process is also there where the gases is kindly uh, directly converting into the uh, solid uh, state okay so write down the next property where the change of state is there of a substance from gas to liquid so that is called as deposition where the change in state of a substance is there from gas to solid without changing into liquid state is called as deposition all right so this was about the interconversion from one states of matter if we are talking about effect of temperature whether we are applying heat whether we are releasing heat whether we are uh, cooling down or means reducing the temperature so this was about effect of temperature on these particular states of matter by which we can interconvert it so now let's understand the second method by which we can also interchange a particular state of matter which was effect of change of pressure so yes definitely let's understand when we apply pressure the particles uh, of the particular matter will be coming closer right we are actually uh, reducing the kinetic energy so let's understand the first case where gases are converting into the liquid state so it can be liquefied the gases can be liquefied if we apply pressure i as i have just discussed it here so suppose this is the gaseous matter and here is the liquid matter so if we will be applying more pressure means we are asking the particles to come more closer to each other so we are applying pressure here and if we are reducing the temperature as well so both the cases in which the gases will be converting into the liquid state when a high pressure will be there and uh, when we are reducing the temperature so arrow up means high and arrow down means low and when reducing the temperature so this it will be compressed and the temperature will be lowered where the gas can be convert into the liquid state so uh, one of the example i can also give for other pressure as well like solid carbon dioxide i hope you must have seen uh, these fumes which are being directly converted so this was solid carbon dioxide it is directly being converted into the gaseous state so it is being stored under very high pressure we have to allow, apply a lot of pressure so that this particular gas carbon dioxide these particles can come really very much closer to each other so that they can solidify so by applying high pressure we are converting into the solid carbon dioxide but once these pressure is been taken away they can directly convert into the gaseous state when we decrease the pressure so they can convert into the gaseous state applying pressure they will be coming back to the solid state if we are decreasing the pressure they will be coming back to the gaseous state without coming into the liquid state so this is the direct reason why solid carbon dioxide is also known as dry ice right so this is also one of the very very important interconversion which we have understood if we are changing the pressure right similarly we have the evaporation where the liquid state converts into the uh, gaseous state at any temperature below its boiling point right so this was about evaporation as well so let's understand this was about temperature and pressure uh, if we change now let's understand that are there any particular factors behind the uh, rate of the evaporation so let's understand this as well so yes of course evaporation takes place right at any temperature uh, yes there are differences between boiling and the evaporation so let's understand first of all evaporation so evaporation is a process in which the conversion of substance liquid state into the gaseous state at any temperature this is the major condition which is happening let me give you uh, one example so uh i hope you must have dried your clothes under the sun right we don't know the temperature might be 35 or 40 degree right but the water uh, the water from the clothes gets evaporated right so that is the evaporation method which was going on so let's understand the effects which are there so that it, are, it is affecting the rate of evaporation so first let's understand the 
surface area so if it's a greater surface area of the matter the rate of evaporation also gets increases so if it is greater surface area of the liquid it can easily convert it into gaseous state the rate of evaporation increasing on increasing the surface or area of the liquid so this is the first major factor which is there which is dependent on the rate of evaporation if lesser surface area or uh, i can give you more examples that uh, there is a saucer pan there is a cup also and uh, of course there is a hot tea inside it the surface area is small here in the tea but where is the saucer pan it is having greater surface area okay so when we pour this tea over here so it can easily come down it can easily cool down as well right so the because of the rate of evaporation so this was the first major factor uh, affecting the rate of evaporation let's understand the second one let's understand the temperature so i was just giving you an example before about drying of the clothes the wet clothes basically under the sun so if there is no sun or uh, there is a night time or we can say uh, like today is not a sunny day rainy day is there so that means the temperature is not high right so if the temperature is not high then the rate of evaporation can decrease but if the temperature is high the rate of evaporation also increases so increases if the temperature is high the rate of evaporation also gets increases so this is how you can learn and understand if there is a sunny day uh, the temperature is also high so easily our dry uh, wet clothes can be dried up because the temperature is high and the rate of evaporation gets also increases okay let's understand vice versa as well if it is a humid day It's, there is already lot of water vapor in the atmosphere and we are asking the wet clothes so that they can also dry but yes they do not get dried easily because already lots of water vapor is there in the atmosphere right so if there is lesser humidity right if there is lesser humidity then only the rate of evaporation gets increased up so this is vice versa if the temperature is high then the rate of evaporation increases but if the humidity is high then rate of evaporation decreases or if the humidity is lesser then only the rate of evaporation gets increased so now let's understand the fourth major uh, rate uh, factor which is the wind speed and if we say that if it's a windy day and a uh, high speed of wind is being going on so that means the rate of evaporation or evaporation also gets increases so increase in the wind speed which leads to the increase in the rate of evaporation so this can also be understood by again the drying off of the clothes as well the high speed of wind is there and we can easily make the wet clothes into dry one when there is a high wind speed going on so this was about all the factors let's quickly revise it again so the first factor which we have discussed is the surface area then we have discussed about temperature humidity and the wind speed so this was about the interconversion and also that on what factors the rate of evaporation depends now we will be understanding the last major concept regarding the states of matter evaporation whenever there is an evaporation it causes cooling sometimes okay let's understand how so i can give you simple example uh, when there is an acetone or nail paint remover on our palm whenever we put it on our palm it feels really very much cooler let's understand how this is going on so actually yes of course that liquid is coming into the gaseous state during this process of evaporation the particles of the liquid they absorb the energy so students you can write down they absorb the energy or we can say of course latent heat of vaporization was also going on here as they have absorbed the energy the particles of the liquid they have absorbed the energy from the surrounding to get so that they can convert into the gaseous state so they they need energy or we can say latent heat of vaporization so that they can convert into the gaseous state this absorption of energy makes the surroundings 
cooler as the liquid has taken energy from the surrounding or from the atmosphere so that it can convert into the gaseous state due to which our atmosphere we feel cooler so we can also give one more example that like uh, perspiration of sweating or when there is a sweating in the body it keeps the body temperature constant by taking away the extra heat from the body or we can say as the latent heat of vaporization so this was about students about a uh, rate of uh, evaporation which causes the cooling or uh, previously we have discussed about how we can convert from one state of matter into the another state of matter so i hope you all have understood this as well and one more application uh, let's quickly apply as we are discussing about evaporation as well that uh, of course people do wear cotton clothes right people do wear cotton clothes in summer time let's understand how so yes the answer remains the same uh, as of course we perspire more more sweating is there and as the sweat evaporates so sweat it evaporates easily through the cotton clothes it takes energy from the body and it keeps our body cool as it takes the energy from the body surface so that they can convert into the gaseous state and the cotton they can absorb sweat easily and so that they can expose it to the atmosphere and this is why we can feel cool when there is a summer time by wearing cotton clothes so this is the major major reasons behind all the uh, doubts and questions which we have just discussed and all the topics so previous let's quickly revise so previously we have discussed about the effect of pressure effect of change of the temperature effect of change of the pressure as well how we can convert from solid to liquid and gaseous state and vice versa then we have also discussed that directly we can convert solid to gas and gas to uh, solid as well by of course uh changing the pressure as well then we have also understood about the latent heat which is the hidden heat which is being required to convert from one state into the another state and lastly we have discussed about the factors which are there to which are affecting the rate of evaporation which is surface area temperature humidity and wind speed i hope you all have understood the concept thank you so much everyone